Good morning, everybody. Chukhinuch. My name is Rissel Koy. I'm going to be your moderator for this best practices in remote sensing and grave detection. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite forward Ted Godfredson from Tecumseh to Shoetma. He is the manager of the Culture and Language Revitalization Department, and he's going to start us off in a good way. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ted, and thank you for everybody joining us online. We are recording all of this and we will make it available and we'll share that information at the very end of where you can find things. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ted Godfredson. Ted Godfredson in Squawks. Yes, as la as as a tiks as to mammals, them quiet in a residential school. Called Cookby, he has cooked stacku, who quiet the stem in the alley, pin to seat. Look. Kuchachem, thank you so very much to Ted Godfredson for uh, starting us off in a good way. As you may have noted, as we have just shared, um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we want to be able to share it with people. We've had a number of requests of people saying, thank you so much. Uh, we are unable to make it. It is relatively short notice of putting this out. So we want to make sure that it will be available and we will, will share where to find that afterwards. Again, as you heard uh, um, you say at the very beginning, uh, my name is Rissel Koy. I'm also known as La Loya. La Loya comes from my Statlium relatives. I am honored um, and connected to the Statlium nation, the lower Statlium peoples, as well as the Northern Shewetmach. And I'm honored to serve today as your moderator. So as I said, this is the webinar on best practices in remote sensing and grave detection. I'm just going to go over the agenda for today. Again, thank you so much to Ted for uh, that beautiful prayer in the Shwetmastin language. I'm honored to be serving you today from Shwetmach Ulu, uh, from the lands of my grandfather, Eric Hillman. And um, I want to also acknowledge that we are in the council chambers for the city of Kamloops today. So the first thing that we have up there right now is the agenda. As you can see, we have the, um, we're going to hear next from uh, Cook B. Rose on Kashmir to come to Shwetma. We're going to then hear from the Canadian Archaeological Association President, Dr. Lisa Hodgetts. We're going to then hear from Dr. Martindale on a GPR focused discussion then followed by Dr. Keisha Supernant on other forms of remote sensing. So really those first three presentations after Cookby Kashmir is all about providing a broad overview about remote sensing. Oh, I don't know what just happened with the slide, but remote sensing as well as um, other options that you have beyond GPR. But given that we use GPR, we want to give it a focus. Uh, we're then going to go into the case study of Tecumas to Shoetmoch. And what we have learned, we're going to again hear from Ted Godfredson um, and his, his, his experience in moving forward on this, as well as a GPR specialist that we were honored to work with, Dr. Sarah Bolio. We're then going to open up to a question and answer period with everybody uh, who um, has participated. And we will close as we open in a good way. We're going to close in a good way uh, with, again, turning to Ted Godfredson. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn now to um, Cookby Roseanne Kashmir, who is the um, uh, Cookby of Tecumseh Tishwema. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ted Gottwardson, for the opening prayer. It is so good to hear our language spoken by the next generation. To everyone joining us online, Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I am delighted to welcome everyone here, both physically and virtually to our territory within Shwetmaguru. I am 
proud to be welcoming you from the direct ancestor lands of Tecamos de Schwabmach. As we begin this webinar today, I want to begin by acknowledging Indian residential school survivors and intergenerational survivors. No words are sufficient to express the comfort and love that we wish to express to you. We see you, we love you, and we believe you. I also wish to acknowledge all the communities grappling with their recent findings. We grieve with you in this confirmation of further missing children at other Indian residential schools. We stand as you move forward onto the next steps to address these heart-wrenching findings. Our journey as caretakers of missing children from the Kamloops Indian Residential School became public on May the 27th. First, a quick background about Kamloops Indian Residential School. The Kamloops de Schwemek is the home community of the Kamloops Indian Residential School, which was the largest Indian residential school in the school system. Given the site of the school, there were up to 500 students registered and attending at any one time. From oral tellings from survivors, we know that there were students from the Yukon, Northern Alberta, and even parts of the United States and all throughout British Columbia. With the assistance of Dr. Sarah Ulio from the University of Fraser Valley, we confirmed an unthinkable loss that was stolen and spoken about, but never documented by the Kamloops Indian Residential School. With the help of the ground penetrating radar technology, the stark truth about the preliminary findings came to light. The confirmation of the remains of 215 children who were students of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. We had a knowing in our community that we were able to verify. To our knowledge, these missing children are undocumented deaths. Some were as young as three years old, and we sought out a way to confirm that knowing out of the deepest respect and love for those missing children and their families. And understand what Mike is the current resting place of these children. This work was undertaken by the Tecamos de Schwetmik Language and Culture Department with ceremonial knowledge keepers who ensured that the work was conducted respectfully in light of the serious nature of the investigation with cultural protocols being upheld. You may be asking yourself why we decided to co-host this best practice webinar. When we shared about the preliminary findings at the end of the day, we were with all kinds of offers to help. Not all offers created equal. It was clear some were seeking to take advantage of the situation. And we want to share our experience so that other communities embarking on this heart-wrenching journey of truth can have some insight. We wanted to share that working with an experienced GPR specialist could look what that could look like, particularly given that there are very significant roles for our Shwatma culture, our protocols during this process. I want to acknowledge the incredible staff working for Tecamos de Shwatma, both within the culture and language department and revitalization, as well as our natural resources departments. We've, we lean on them for their technical expertise and guidance in navigating the journey of bringing science to shed light on the Kamloops Indian Residential School survivors' oral tellings. Tecamos de Shwetmik was very fortunate to work with Dr. Sarah Bulio, who is just under a decade of expertise in remote sense and ground pen radar for um, burials. From our context, unmarked graves on the grounds of a former residential schools to identifying graves of former POW camps. 
From last week's public presentation to today's webinar, we are so fortunate to have connected with the Canadian Archaeological Association and the Institute of Indigenous and Prairie Archaeology. The Canadian Archaeological Association have been working diligently to share information about the remote sensing and grave detection. As you can well imagine, requests for their assistance and insight has jumped exponentially. The Institute of Indigenous and Prairie Archaeology brings on the ground expertise in working with Indigenous communities, as well as offering to be the best virtual host for the webinar. Also, I would like to thank the city of Kamloops as they're providing the space that we are using today physically to host the webinar as the Kamloops and Schwetmeck facilities are currently oriented to supporting wildfire evacuees. Access to expertise and experts is so critical. This is what drove us to reach out to the Canadian Archaeological Association and the Institute of Indigenous and Prairie Archaeology and partner with them for this webinar. This webinar is focused on the practical. Choices of remote sensing from what was used at the Kamloops Indian ground penetrating radar to other options that are available. It is also focused on how to weave in Indigenous culture, values, and protocols. Tukamos Shwetmak will also be sharing about the very practical aspects of working with a remote sensing expert, ensuring that the process incorporates both science as well as Shwetmak culture, values, and those protocols. We refer to that as walking on two legs one leg being Western ways of knowing, and the other being Schwetmik ways of knowing. It's not just First Nations, but also Métis and Inuit, who also attended residential schools. We did our best to put a call out to the interested First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit communities and organizations to participate in this free webinar. Be it Tacoma Sushwemek or any other communities grappling with their findings, we need practical supports within our communities and the resources needed to undertake this very important work. So as I stated last week, this is a long process that will take significant time and resources. They were children, robbed of their families and their childhood. We need to now give them the dignity that they never had. Thank you, Kukshacha. Kukshacha, thank you very much. Kukbi Rosan, Kashmir to come to Shwetmuk. I was so excited to get started to have our beautiful prayer in Shwetmustine to have uh, to come to Shwetmuk Kukbi here that I forgot to mention a couple of additional housekeeping things. Um, as this is a webinar, how you uh, do your uh, questions is in the chat. We will be taking the questions live, meaning when we get to the Q&A, we will, whatever questions are posted there, we will turn to those. What we like to do is encourage people to look at what questions are posted, perhaps something similar to what you're wanting to ask there question you want to ensure that it is asked you can go call do what is referred to as up voting so just simply click on the little thumbs up icon and then we'll that will push that question to the very top another thing i wanted to make everybody aware of is i'm so grateful for the technology such as zoom um, it gives us an opportunity to connect there can be technical issues and there can also be unfortunately sometimes malicious intent so if anything happens whether it's a technical or malicious such as what we refer to as zoom bombing know that everybody who is registered will receive an email well everybody but the person who disrupts <laughs> everybody will receive a, a link to the webinar again we did have a question about the recording I, we will be providing that we will do a follow-up by everybody of where that recording will be uh, um, at this time it is my delight now to turn to Dr. Lisa Hodgetts. And Dr. Lisa Hodgetts, and I like to, by the way, I'm going to refer to everybody as doctor and first name. Um, it just is um, every, every one here so far I've had a chance to interact with. They're lovely, lovely people. 
And uh, I want to say thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lisa Hudgets. She is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Western Ontario. She is a settler archaeologist with 15 years of experience in community-based research with the Inuvialuit communities in Canada's Western Arctic. She is co-director of, you're going to have to help me pronounce that because I do not speak Inuvialuit, um, uh, Dr. Hodgetts, um, the Inuvialuit Living History Project, and previously directed the um, archaeology project again invite you to correct me on the pronunciation she has published on the use of remote sensing techniques to locate archaeological features and has expertise in zoo archaeology the study of animal bones from archaeological sites her current research also examines the ethics and practices of archaeology in Canada and the ways in which different aspects of an individual's identity come together to shape their experience in the discipline. She is president of the Canadian Archaeological Association and was recently named a faculty scholar at Western, an award that recognizes outstanding scholarly achievements of individuals who are leaders in their field. In 2018, she was awarded a university-wide Edward C. Pleva Award of Excellence in Teaching. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lisa. Hand it over to you. Thank you, Rissell, um, and thank you so much to Kupi and to Ted for their words earlier. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. I'm joining from London, Ontario, which is on the traditional territories of the Anishinaab, the Haudenosaunee, the Anapiwak, and the Chinantown peoples. Um, and the CAA is really delighted to be able to partner with Tacoma's Tishwakmak and also our, our colleagues at the Institute for Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta in offering this webinar. Um, so just to begin, I want to note that the CAA recognizes that not all communities are in the same place with respect to this incredibly difficult journey to find and honor their missing children. Some, like Tecumseh Tishwamak, have been walking this road for a long time already, and others are only just beginning. Uh, so we know also that some communities have lots of relevant expertise within their communities. Others have many, many questions. As an organization, the CAA recognizes and respects every community's right to walk this path in their own way and at their own pace. Um, it's a really long and difficult journey. And so we encourage communities to take their time so that they can have all the necessary supports in place. We know too that most schools took children from multiple communities, often over huge distances. So coordinating between all the communities who lost children at each school is going to take time. As an organization, uh, the CAA has struck a working group on unmarked graves. And our goal is to develop information resources for communities to help them make informed decisions as they navigate this process. We're sharing those resources on our website. Uh, so far, we have a short video from Dr. Keisha, who you'll hear from in a moment, about GPR, uh, an FAQ document about remote sensing, and then a document that I'm going to walk you through now, which is all about the pathways for locating unmarked graves. Um, it's really important uh, because there's a wide range of expertise required um, to undertake these investigations. Many communities will be working with outside experts to do this work. And so it's, it's really important that communities emphasize the importance of respectful practices. Um, that means first off, recognizing the huge potential emotional impacts of this work for survivors and intergenerational survivors and their families. Um, it's, it's such difficult work. Uh, it's also really important uh, for any outside experts to follow the community's lead here. Um, all decisions rest with communities um, and anyone working with communities needs to respect that. It's also so important to honor the importance of ceremony. Uh, we know, you know, there are very culturally specific ceremonies that are required in this work. Uh, it's going to vary from place to place what those ceremonies look like, uh, but 
they need to be respected. It's also crucial that any outside experts recognize the importance of including oral history and Indigenous knowledge, um, those tellings that Kukpi spoke of from survivors are crucial to this effort. It's also very important uh, that when outside experts are brought in, they take the time uh, to really, you know, both sides need to clarify expectations around the process and the possibilities. So it is important that communities understand how these different techniques work and also know a bit about their limitations. Experts need to provide results as quickly as possible um, just because of the emotional weight of this work. You know, we communities shouldn't be having to wait. Um, and it's crucial from the very beginning that they develop very clear data agreements. So, you know, communities need to control all of the data from these, these efforts, and that needs to be spelled out clearly from the get-go. Um, there's a wide range of expertise that's going to come into play and be very important in the search for missing children. Uh, there's such a wide range of information. It's going to take people with expertise in archival research, working with documents and records. Um, in some cases, you know, there should be work with survivors where they're willing to document their memories and knowledge. Uh, remote sensing can play an important role. And in some cases, communities may also wish to pursue forensic work. Um, we've laid out sort of a recommended order for these steps, but you know, there are many different possible orders that could work. It does make sense for some steps to come before others in the process. Um, and other steps like memorialization, for example, can take place at any stage in the process. So this should all be, as I've mentioned, community-based work. Uh, it's important to secure all of the appropriate permissions for the work to take place and to include the appropriate protocols and ceremonies. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission suggested that it should be the most impacted community that leads the work for any, any given school, but that all communities with children at the school should be involved in the decision-making. Training will be very important in this process, uh, both for communities to understand the techniques um, and, you know, they may also want to learn to use the techniques and deploy them themselves. Um, it's also going to be important that any outside um, experts that are brought in to conduct the work are educated in community protocols and ceremonies that are appropriate to the work. Uh, and it's super important that there's a scope of work agreement at the beginning so that, you know, the work to be conducted is clearly laid out and everybody understands the expectations. We know that efforts to locate missing children are going to re-traumatize survivors and inter intergenerational survivors community members, families. Uh, so it's crucial that all of the right supports need to be in place. Spiritual, emotional, mental health supports, physical health supports, all the supports for well-being. Um, and we've been lobbying as an organization uh, for community ceremony and healing practices to be recognized and funded as a crucial part of this effort. There's a lot of archival research that ideally should happen in the early stages of this work to help to identify likely areas for burials. Um, we know there's lots of information in archival records. Those records are held by communities, by the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, by governments and churches. Um, and so it's we encourage communities to seek information from all possible sources. And we echo the calls for organizations who haven't already done so to release those records immediately. Um, 
Archival work is complex. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is developing a guide to archival research. Um, it will be important to collect and analyze the documents, any older maps uh, and building plans to help to pinpoint areas where burials might be likely. Um, it's going to mean developing secure and accessible archives to store this information. And that should all be done according to OCAP principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. All of those things should rest with Indigenous communities. Um, it's also going to mean we need long-term storage plans for those archival data. Um, and we know that the, the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation is working on being able to provide that for Indigenous communities under those OCAP principles, if communities wish to work with the NCTR on this. We know that many survivors have knowledge of the location of missing children. Um, and obviously recalling this information can be deeply traumatizing. So it's so important um, that all the necessary supports are in place. It'll also be important to develop and implement appropriate recording protocols like the ones that were used by the TRC for those survivors who choose to share um, those memories. There's a lot of information to bring together, um, to store, analyze, and display. That can include documents, maps, survivor testimonies, things like ground penetrating radar data. Um, so it's very important to establish a secure system, um, particularly one that can, that can link a lot of that information to its spatial location. It should be done in a culturally appropriate way. And typically we use geographical information systems, GIS, to manage complex information like this, particularly when there's a spatial component. Mapping of the site around the former schools is gonna be particularly important. Um, there have often been changes over time. Uh, we know that many schools you know, were you know, built and rebuilt at different locations over time. So it's important to have as much information as possible. Local geology is important uh, because it can impact the applicability of different remote sensing techniques. We need to um, compile those records. It's also important uh, to document any impacts to the area through construction or previous archeological work, because that can also impact um, where graves might remain and the applicability of remote sensing to find missing graves. Um, creating a detailed surface map, a topographic map that records all the surface contours of the area is, is a really important early step. Um, there are things like drone mounted LIDAR. That's a technique that could be used to develop that kind of detailed topographic map at the beginning. Um, and a walkover survey with survivors if they wish to be involved um, to locate former buildings on the land, um, you know, identify areas where graves are likely. Because remote sensing is very time consuming, it's quite labor intensive. It, it's not practical in most cases to survey with remote sensing the entire area around a school. It's important to narrow the search and focus in on the most likely areas to deploy remote sensing. Um, both Dr. Andrew and Dr. Keisha are going to say more about particular remote sensing techniques, um, but there are a range of techniques that can help to establish the location of graves without serving, disturbing, I'm sorry, the ground surface. GPR is one of those that we've heard a lot about since the announcement from Tacoma's to Schwartmuck. Um, there are others. 
and I will leave Dr. Keisha to say more about those because that's really that's why we're here today is to hear about those techniques. Uh, communicating the results is important, the results of remote sensing survey. Um, we would expect anyone doing the work to provide both a written and a verbal re report to communities once that work is done. And here's sort of a, an abridged list of some of the important elements that that report should include. The CAA Pathways document on our website has an even more complete list of those things, but it should cover survey design, how the data was collected, the anomalies that were located, um, some evaluation of the confidence with which the interpretations were made. As I mentioned, memorialization uh, to honor those children could happen at any stage, and that should be decided by the communities whose children went missing from or died at the school. Uh, it could involve some kind of permanent marker. Obviously, there would be ceremony involved in that commemoration. Uh, and some communities may choose to undertake further work after remote sensing. Um, some may wish to confirm that there were burials and do that through excavation. Um, some may wish to exhume their missing children to allow them to be identified and appropriately reburied. And some communities may wish to conduct forensic investigations. Um, we just want to point out uh, that any excavation and recovery requires um, consideration of the, the heritage legislation and the medical legal legislation, um, which is particular to individual provinces and territories. And it's so important that people, experts with specific training are involved in that work because it can have implications in criminal investigations. Thank you, um, so, Thank you so much, on. Lisa. We appreciate it. We appreciate the enthusiasm of academics making uh, information very approachable. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a time limit. We want to get to the other presenters as well. So thank you so much for um, taking us on an excellent beginning of a journey into the pathways of choices. Also know that as much as um, uh, Dr. Lisa cover today. They do have some excellent documents available on uh, the Canadian Archaeological Association website. There's also, if you're less of a reader and more of a watcher, there's also a great little video to watch there as well. At this time, we're going to now go over specifically into ground penetrating radar. And that um, discussion will be led by Dr. Andrew or that presentation will be done by Dr. Andrew Martindale. He is an archaeologist and his research focuses on the histories of Indigenous people of the northwest coast of North America, primarily the Shimshan and the Musqueam people. For him, working collaboratively with Indigenous descent communities creates a fundamental interdisciplinary it's an interdisciplinarity between the traditions of Western and Indigenous scholarships. That is such a typical academic word, interdisciplinarity. Um, his recent work is an explicit evaluation of the links between science of material history and the literature of Indigenous oral records of nine tribes and Gitanyao people over the Holocene. This work demonstrated the remarkable capacity of Indigenous oral records accurately record millennia of history, something that, while well, obvious to Indigenous com communities, is less well understood in the non-Indigenous settler colonial state. These results also cast some light on the vulnerabilities of different knowledge frameworks, including those of science to ethnocentrism and the prescription and explanation of history. His work addresses these in both an anthropological theory and increasingly the interpretation of archaeology in Canadian legal histories of Aboriginal rights and titles and in the realm of Indigenous law. He is part of a joint Musqueam UBC platform for research and teaching partnerships focusing on history and archaeology. Uh, there's still more, but I think that's enough of a tongue twister for me right now. Dr. Martindale, we appreciate the work that you do, and we invite you to now proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much. Sorry for all the language. Um, it's a bit of an occupational hazard. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thanks to the Tekemos Teishokwekma people for 
inviting me today uh, and to the survivors, their families and their communities for what I know is a very difficult conversation, uh, part of a long process. I'm also uh, relieved and honored by Ted and uh, Coupe's words uh, helping us navigate through this difficult work. Uh, just to mention, I joined from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, let's start the slideshow if we could. And we can jump on to the second slide when you're ready. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about ground penetrating radar as a tool. I know there'll be a, some specific conversations with Dr. Sarah in a, in a little bit. Uh, the, the technology um, is widely used now. It was developed. Andrew, I'm just going to interrupt. So sorry. Um, we want to give you the time, but also you're speaking a little bit fast for the live caption. So um, okay. if you could just slow down by a, a titch, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for the for the point. So ground penetrating radar was developed uh, in the 1970s, but became much more widely um, used in the 2000s when self-contained units such as the type that are being used today became available. And it was taken up not only by industry for the location of buried things such as pipes and foundations, but also by archaeologists looking for buried uh, ancestors remains as well as in burials as well as archaeological sites. It works in a principle that's quite similar to navigational radar. It sends out an electromagnetic signal and based on reflections of that signal it identifies things in the in the, uh, in the zone that it's being studied in navigation across the ocean and in, uh, in ground penetrating radar in the ground. Uh, it also can tell you a little bit about not only what is there but how far away it is and thus how deep it is into the ground. Uh, next slide please. The principle is, is fairly straightforward, although in practice it can be a little bit complicated. Uh, we send out with one of these carts um, uh, an electromagnetic signal into the ground, and based on the reflective pattern that comes back, which is recorded by a, a receiver, uh, the tool monitors and maps what the subsurface looks like uh, based on its electromagnetic reflective patterns. Um, these reflections then create images that can be visualized and interpreted. And typically, when we're looking for archaeological sites or cemetery work, we're, we're investigating the subsurface to a depth of about two meters. And the frequencies that we use to, to see that far down into the ground resolve or identify things that are about the size of a soccer ball or, or, or larger. And that's the balance. The, the deeper the signal goes, the larger the thing that you're looking for has to be in order to see it. And so you can go very, find very small things, but only near the surface or very large things, but they, they are, they have to be very, that are very buried quite deep. Uh, for work in archaeology and in cemeteries, this balance seems to work reasonably well. And to, to point out, we, we, we don't usually see the contents of graves. Uh, it doesn't produce an image like an x-ray. Instead, what we're really most likely seeing are the grave shafts themselves. The, 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 the grave, the burial itself uh, is what stands out in the radar. Next slide, please. Here's just an example from a published book on cemeteries. Ground penetrating radar really has shown itself to be a very useful tool in formal cemeteries. And these are places where the graves stand out against the background material of the subsurface. And that's because cemeteries are largely chosen for areas where it's fairly easy to dig graves. And so the background sediment tends to be pretty uniform and for ground penetrating radar, not particularly reflective. And so the grave shafts themselves are visible quite clearly in the ground penetrating radar views. Uh, we also get a, a, a sense in a cemetery of a, of a pattern, regular rows, and orientations are often common in, 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 in formal cemeteries. And these are places then where the tool really works well because you can see each grave and then you can see rows and arrays of graves that make it easier to identify. Less is known uh, when we move away from these formal contexts into clandestine burials such as we might encounter in residential school contexts. We are uh, evaluating this tool, it will work, but as things get busier in the background, when there's more geology and maybe more uh, um, archaeology or other kinds of, of subsurface patterns, the graves don't stand out as clearly because it's a busy background signal. And secondly, the 
the graves in cemeteries tend to be quite formal, rectangular of a, of a, of a re regularized depth. Uh, in clandestine cases, that may not be the, it may, not, it may not be true, and, and that makes it a little bit more challenging. So the burial shafts may be less visible or more challenging to identify, and the background noise may be a little bit higher when we move away from formal cemeteries. This is, a, of course, an avenue that, that is being pursued across the country now. It has been ongoing for a while in some contexts, and that help, that scholarship, that background, is helping us refine this technology for uh, for this uh, for this purpose. Next slide, please. As Lisa mentioned, it's just a step in a longer process that involves many things, uh, including mapping. And mapping the, the location is essential. Uh, she mentioned drone flown LIDAR and other mapping tools. This is an important part. If we're gonna try and locate where a signal of a burial in GPR is on the ground, we need to have a good map base. There are two modes that we use the GPR tool in. One is prospecting and the other is more intense investigation. And, and there's a bit, both have are very appropriate. Often they follow as steps. Prospecting means that we push the device around somewhat uh, roaming in a roaming form, identifying whether we can find signals that look like burials. And investigation allows us to employ grids, more intensive data collection to map out more precisely where burials might be. So both forms are appropriate and they, they often work in sequence, the one to locate and confirm burials, and then the second to provide precise mapping of those burials. There's a bunch of uh, options that uh, the that GPR operators can use, and we're developing at the CAA best practices for their application in, in contexts of cemeteries, but also in IRS contexts. There'll be a little bit of variability depending on the local geography and geology and other factors, but we can, I think we're confident we can come up with some, some good guidelines, some good technical guidelines in the coming weeks and months. As Lisa pointed out, this is a, the act of, of surveying is a burden for survivors and, and the accommodation and, and support for them is an essential piece of any of this. We can't just show up with equipment and start scanning grounds. This is part of a lot, much longer process of support for survivors. Next slide, please. Once we collect the data, there's a second phase and a third phase. We visualize the results of the, of the, of the electromagnetic reflections and then we try and interpret them. And these are places, again, where scholarship is improving. In fact, the ancestors that we have so far heard the voices of through grand penetrating radar are, are helping guide us to better identify missing children. And that process of using the results and the information from the ancestors to, to look forward to, to, to employ GPR in other places is, is ongoing and helpful. And there will be guides coming out, I think, from those who have already done this work over the past few years to help guide future steps. Here's just an example. You can see in the top, a series of GPR signal reflections that are from graves from a cemetery. And that's a plan view from looking from above. They stand out as clusters of reflection in a regularized sort of rectangular set of patterns. And then down below, this is the side view, what's called a radar gram or a profile. And here we can see characteristic shapes in this kind of fuzzy gray image that are identifiable as, as the grave shafts, essentially. Uh, this is in a cemetery, a fairly straightforward process, but of course, as we move into, into a residential school context, it can become a little bit, a little bit more challenging. That's where guides and analyses of previously uh, uh, heard from ancestors will help the future. Next slide, please. So as we move into the residential school context, we know that ground penetrating radar is a reliable tool. It has proven to be very useful in near surface studies in cemeteries. There are other methods. Keisha is going to be speaking of those in just a minute. It's not 100% certain. You can never say that you have for certain a grave in the absence of, uh, of other kinds of tests, nor would I ever say there isn't one just because the, 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 the ground penetrating radar doesn't reveal a signal. But we know we can increase our confidence on both of those edges so so we can be con we can gain confidence especially as we have larger conversations among communities who are doing this work it does rely on a trained set of, of experts um, using appropriate equip equipment and careful uh, skills most of the gpr available and across the country today is in industrial applications not by people who look for graves and cemeteries. So there is a bit of a learning curve for those folks. Uh, and the CA is, is attempting to provide guidance to them uh, through technical documents. Communities 
can develop this capacity themselves. Uh, green ground penetrating radar is not inaccessible. The, the costs are not enormous and the training and the application of it is not inaccessible to communities. And, and I think that's a pathway that many should consider an appropriate space for looking for missing children is, is, is within communities themselves. And my last point is that doing this work will take many, many years, a lot of time and a lot of resources. There are tragically many missing children to be found. Radar is one of those pieces that we can use to locate them. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Andrew. I really appreciate you delivering uh, something that was very approachable. And um, uh, we appreciate how keenly you started and how you let us catch up to you too. Uh, so that's really fantastic. Uh, to continue on to talk about other forms of remote sensing, so beyond what was just presented by Dr. Um, Andrew about uh, ground penetrating radar, I'm ca calling upon Dr. Keisha Supernant, who is the Director of the Institute of Indigenous and Prairie Archaeology. Uh, Dr. Keisha Supernant is Métis and Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. She is Director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology and specializes in community-engaged Indigenous archaeology and geospatial analysis. Her research with Indigenous communities in Western Canada explores how archaeologists can engage in community-led projects that center Indigenous ways of knowing. Recently, she has been increasingly engaged in using remote sensing technologies to locate and protect unmarked burials at the request of First Nations in Alberta and Saskatchewan. She has published in local and international journals on GIS in archaeology, collaborative archaeological practices, Métis archaeology, and Indigenous archaeology in an era of reconciliation. Two books that she co-edited were published in 2020, Archaeology of the Heart with Springer Press, and blurring timescapes, subverting erasure, remembering the ghosts of the margins of history with Berghan books. And again, you can correct me if I got that wrong, Dr. Keisha. Uh, Dr. Um, Supernant is the current chair of the Canadian Archaeological Association Working Group on Unmarked Graves. The floor is yours, Dr. Keisha. Um, hi, hi, Rochelle, for that kind introduction. Tanse, Kisha Supernanditsi Katson, Ms. Pachiwa Skygan Urchinia, Lemachifnia. I am here today on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Metis Nation and very honored to be partnering with Tecumloops to Shwetmek and the Canadian Archaeological Association to provide information about how we can use remote sensing for grave detection. I'm going to quickly run through uh, a few other options beyond ground penetrating radar that communities may find useful in the search for unmarked graves, uh, including some aerial techniques and some ground based techniques. So I'm going to begin by talking about a few options of remote sensing techniques that involve either plane flown or drone flown sensors. So there is a lot of value in bringing together satellite imagery and particularly historical aerial photos of areas around residential schools. Aerial photos in particular can support survivors as they're sharing their experiences because they can reproduce some elements of the landscape that can have changed through time, such as building locations uh, and other features. And Another option is a plane flown LIDAR, and I'll talk more specifically about LIDAR in a moment. Uh, and it can be flown from a plane or can be mounted onto a drone or unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. There are a couple of other drone mounted sensors that are also helpful. These can include various forms of imagery, uh, including multispectral imagery uh, and photography, as well as LIDAR. I'm just going to briefly run through a few of the drone mounted sensors that are optional. Uh, and I think it's important to note that while some of the plane flown materials might be more readily available, there is value on using drones over specific areas of interest because it can often provide more detailed and specific information around possible locations of graves. So one of the areas that can be used from drones is various forms of photography and flying these different times of day can create a sense of the relief of the ground. This is imagery from an early 20th century cemetery with unmarked graves, shared with permission, of course. And it shows uh, when the ground is relatively clear, there's areas of mounding and or depression, which can be associated with 
graves. So when a grave is dug, sometimes the ground will be mounded and sometimes more commonly it will be slightly depressed. And if imagery from drones can sometimes help to detect those areas. Another area that could be further explored uh, is multispectral imagery. So multispectral imagery involves using a camera to take uh, photos of the ground that involve different spectrums of light. These spectrums uh, then can be analyzed to show differences in the health of vegetation. That vegetation health can sometimes indicate what uh, disturbance to the ground from human activity, including potentially digging graves. The example in front of you shows the use of multispectral imaging at an archaeological site that dates from the late um, 19th, 100, 19th century, and it shows Métis cabins uh, that we were able to detect using multispectral imagery. And there's a, a more advanced version of this called hyperspectral imagery, which also may be applicable. But I will say these have not commonly been applied to unmarked grave locations in Canada. So they're not yet fully established in terms of what uh, they can and cannot detect in different environments. So uh, another technique could be drone mounted LIDAR. So LIDAR basically involves sending down a signal of light, a laser, down to the surface of the earth and creating a highly detailed map of the surface in sort of three dimensions, creating a topographic map. This is applied in a whole variety of ways. Archaeologists have applied it for detecting and mapping uh, archaeological sites, for example. In this particular realm, the application of LIDAR could potentially also detect those slight depressions or mounds that could be indicative of uh, graves, but it also can provide a really detailed topographic map that can support other ground-based remote sensing, such as ground penetrating radar. Uh, so it is also a, a useful tool in this process. Some of the benefits of aerial methods is that they tend to be quite a bit quicker than ground-based methods. These landscapes are quite large around residential schools, and we know that there, you know, survivors have knowings around where graves are likely to be, but there's also interest from communities of scanning large areas around to make sure that all of the graves are found. So aerial methods can start to help narrow down areas for application of ground-based remote sensing. They can also see through ground cover. LIDAR in particular is well equipped to be able to sort of remove the vegetation and map the surface of, of the ground. And so in areas where there might be quite a bit of ground cover, it may be useful to do with these aerial methods. They're not as well proven to find burials. So ground penetrating radar is the most established method used to find uh, burials. There could be possibilities here, but there is still more work to be done to know exactly what these different techniques can do in different environments. And also, it, aerial methods rely somewhat on the history of the land. So they detect things on the surface and get hints of what might be happening below the surface, but these actual sensors do not uh, penetrate below the surface of the Earth. There's a few other ground-based remote sensing methods that I want to cover that may also be useful either in concert with GPR or in some cases where ground penetrating radar is not ideal, um, then there are some geological environments where that's the case, or if there's a densely forested area, it can be prohibitive for doing ground penetrating radar. I'm just gonna very briefly run over these so that you're aware of, of what they are broadly and what their applicability might be. These are magnetic radiometry, magnetic susceptibility, and various forms of electric conductivity or electric resistivity. Radiometry is a magnetic technique that measures variation between what's below the surface of the Earth and the overall Earth's magnetic field. It has shown some promise in locating um, unmarked graves. It is more commonly used as a second method to add to something like ground penetrating radar. So if there's a signal in ground penetrating radar and then a magnetic technique is used, it can sometimes show metallic objects that could align with that particular grave reflection in the ground penetrating radar. So this can be used independently, but also can be layered on with ground penetrating radar. Magnetic susceptibility detects the um, 
likelihood of materials below the surface being magnetized. So you expose them to a magnetic field and then certain things are more magnetic and less magnetic. And there also has been some application of this. Uh, this is a, a diagram showing differences between what ground penetrating radar looks like and magnetic susceptibility looks like. Magnetic susceptibility could be useful in wooded areas where ground penetrating radar is less um, applicable. So this is another option that could be explored. The final technique I'm just going to briefly discuss are different types of either resistivity or conductivity. These are kind of similar, but they're the inverse. So resistivity, you, know, you put two electrodes on the ground and run an electric current and see differences in how the ground resists the current. Conductivity is sort of the, in the opposite, which is you use a similar technique, but see how conductive the ground might be. And again, in, in these locations, in some of these locations, this could be applicable to uh, detecting graves. And there has been some examples in cemeteries of this working quite well. It is another technique that could be used in addition to and alongside ground penetrating radar or in environments where ground penetrating radar may not work well, such as environments with large amounts of clay where the signal of GPR does not often penetrate very deep. So we know that ground penetrating uh, methods can look below the surface in a way that those aerial methods uh, can't. They can work in areas where ground penetrating radar is not an ideal solution. And they also can help to build an understanding of what's happening below the surface um, in a, layering on to something like ground penetrating radar. Many ground-based methods can be quite slow in that they don't cover as much area nearly as quickly as aerial methods. They require specific applications. And these techniques I've expressed today are less established, especially in Canada, for finding um, unmarked graves. I'm just gonna end here with this pathway slide and just reiterate that the, how communities walk this path is entirely you know, up to them. We are here to try to provide some information about uh, what are some of the options are and provide reliable knowledge about the applications of some of these technologies to remote sensing. And all of this is part of a large process of helping to bring these children home. Hi, hi. Shacham, thank you so very much. Um, to Dr. Uh, Keisha for that presentation. We're now gonna go uh, delve into the reality of what Tecumlis Teshuatmuk has been facing these past months, if not years. It is my honor to call upon Ted Godfordson, who is the manager of Tecumlis Teshuatmuk Language and Culture Revitalization Department. Ted is, from, we're very fortunate, Ted is serving his own nation, Tecumlis Teshuatmuk, and he's been married to his wife, Sharon, for 30 years and has raised their four children on the reserve. Ted considers us both fortunate as well as a sense of pride to have the opportunity to have his children grounded in their home community. Ted has spent his adult life in pursuit of learning Shwetmastin. As residential school survivors, none of the parents spoke language. It wasn't until his early 20s that Ted was fortunate enough to find two elders who were willing to speak and teach him his language. Um, and that's when his language learning became, began in earnest. And of course, a heartfelt cooks chachem to elders, Clara, Charlie, and Vivian P Williams for being very generous with their time, patience, and laughter with Ted. They were the first of many elders who took the time to share and teach with Ted. Ted has completed an MA from the Simon Fraser University in 2019. His research focused on the customs, practices, protocols, and structures, both, both linguistic and cultural, of traditional personal names and naming for the Shuetmach. Ted was a Shwetmastin teacher in the Kamloops Thompson School District for 20 years, after which he began working for his community to come to Shwetmach in language revitalization. And it was here that his work and studies in Shwetmastin took on a broader scope to include the devices that were used to commit linguicide, along with many other acts against humanity on Shwetmach people. Through this work, the Tecumseh to Shwetmach Department of Culture and Language Revitalization undertook the steps to find the missing children buried at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Thank you so much for joining us, Ted. The floor is yours. Cook Stetim Rassel for that introduction. Uh, um, so this is just a little bit on our journey um, and our perspective of everything that's happened to date. So as you can see from the previous presenters, um, 
th there's a lot of knowledge and skilled people out there ready, willing, and able to, to, to help whoever it is on this journey. Um, our part is taking care of our people our, and incorporating our ways of knowing into this process. Um, so I just like to start with how, how our journey began. So a couple of years ago, our department applied for funding through um, Pathways to Healing Heritage Canada. And, and it was to um, upgrade, maintain, fix paths that are in the Sequimic Museum Heritage Park. And unfortunately, after we were approved, um, COVID hit and, and it did affect our deliverables and the funders reached out to our department to ask if there was something else that we would like to do with the funding. Um, and so we met and it, it was decided that um, we should find the children that, that we had heard were, and we'd always heard were buried down in the heritage park. Uh, but at that time it was an orchard. Um, so that, that started our process and what we ended up doing was reaching out to the natural resources department within to come moves to Sohoppen. And um, uh, my hands go up to that department and particularly Leslie Labordi, who connected us with Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn, who in turn um, connected or recommended Dr. Bolio to uh, conduct the, the ground penetrating radar search. So that, that process um, took a couple of years um, and took some time to get, to get Dr. Bolio up to Camelos due to COVID and travel restrictions between um, health, health authorities and all of that kind of stuff. So that was quite the process, but we did get uh, Dr. Bolio to, to come loops on May long weekend. And for four days, she did her ground penetrating radar search and it was um, discussed and it was really important to our department and specifically on the advice of the one elder we have in our department that all of this search uh, take place with um, people who are spiritual knowledge keepers to, to maintain that dignity for our children and, and to incorporate and include our ways of knowing in this process right from the start. So um, that's that, that every step of the way, uh, we have obviously kept it our, in our hearts. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And everything is always goes back to the 215 kids. So everything we do is to honor them. And, and, and so all of our decisions are, are based upon that. And um, let me see here. So the importance of, of having the resources in terms of survivors is um, incalculable. They, the assistance they have given us, you know, it, it, it's them who tell us, you know, where should we search on the grounds? Um, so after, after the findings, uh, we have had um, survivors say that probably our next um, target should be the old dump site of, of the residential school and the hor horrible stories of children being thrown into the, the garbage dump. So that's probably going to be our next targeted area. Um, so one of the approach that uh, was mentioned earlier by Cookby Kasmer was the um, walking on two legs. And, and, and that is really important. And that is something that uh, we incorporate in everything that we do. Uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, we obviously need the experts and um, who are educated in Western society system but we also want to maintain our identity and, and implement our ways of knowing and all of these things. So that, that is the walking on two legs um, for us. Um, so after the findings, um, it's been a very steep learning curve for our department and for our community, for our leadership, for everyone involved in Tukum Loops. Um, you know, there's, as, as the, the people who are um, entrusted with hosting these children 
um, and the residential school itself. Uh, it's been a big responsibility for our community, for our department and for, for our leadership. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that also happened was that no one felt left behind. And uh, that includes our neighboring communities, the Stuatnum, Hanskapum, Statlum, Peshachlum, all who would have had to send their children to our school um, or to the school in our territory. It wasn't our school. I'd like to clarify that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that those communities had the opportunity to pay their respects to perform their ceremonies. And that has been quite the process for us as well, because it's been uh, very emotional. It's been very uh, tiring. It's also been very uplifting at the same time to see the resilience of all of the communities and all of the people who, and survivors who, who come, pay their respects, perform ceremonies, sing their songs, say their prayers, it's been um, amazing for us as well as it, it does take a lot of work and it takes a lot out of our people. That's one of the things that uh, as a host community, if, if, you, if this falls upon your community, it is going to be many days of long days and few breaks. I think it's um, something that uh, we didn't, I know I didn't fully understand what was going to unfold after the release of this information. And it's been um, a very, very whirlwind of activity. And despite all of that, I think one of the things we need to make sure we do is to take our time and get things right. Because the, the, every, like I said, everything that we're doing is for those 215 kids and, and it's 215 plus we're we're not done um but that's the number everybody knows so i, I will use that um so the other thing that is really important is the um the flow of information and uh, the flow of information between departments the flow of information to the community the flow of information to the general public you know there's a there this situation um, really illustrates how things can be taken out of context, can uh, evolve and change and just become something different. Uh, it's, so it's really important that the, the, the sharing of information, it comes from the community and that it's got your stamp of approval. There, there will be many things that are going to happen that are obviously beyond the control of the community, but the, the part we can control is that information. I think that's one of the important things to, to remember uh, in all of this. Um, so let me see here, the realities. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, just the thing to remember is that um, whatever decisions are made, oh, I should mention, one of, the th one of the important things that has come out of this is uh, our community has created a grassroots um, committee. Through this committee, um, advice is given to chief and council, advice is given to our department. Um, the, this committee is made up of representatives from from each of the major grassroots families that are found within Tikumlups to Sukhwapum. Um, it is a strong committee made up of residential school survivors, made up of elders, um, and well-respected members of each family. So it's a, it's a powerful committee, and I think that's one of the uh, strengths that um, we can draw upon as a community and that probably any other community as well, because it's something that um, provides us with uh, advice, leadership, and just that feeling of uh, security, because they, they, they are very um, appreciative, very understanding and supportive. So it, it, I think that was, you know, 
we rely a lot on chief and council. We rely a lot on our department, but one of the new found um, strengths that we have is this committee. So uh, I think, you know, that is another important part I'd like to share is that that's, that's the voice of our community is, is that, um, is that group. So um, that's, those are the, some of the things that we have learned in our, in our journey, our short journey. I'd like to leave you all with a, a, an invitation. If you ever need any information, just reach out to TTES. We're, we're more than willing to share what we have learned because it is a lot more than what I have shared today. But um, yeah. Thank you so very much, uh, Ted Godfordson. I know I've, I've bore witness to the unending day nights that you put in with you and your team um, and leadership that you, you and your team have shown uh, as well. And I just, I raise my hands to you. Um, and just when we were putting together this webinar, I realized that we could have spent an entire webinar just talking on the practicality of what Tecumseh Teshwatmach is in as far as planning. We wanted, knowing that people were being solicited uh, and looking at remote sensing, we wanted to give people that first insight, but give you a good taste of some of the very practical sides of before and after. So again, thank you so much for that, Ted. And Ted will be available for questions as well, along with all the other panelists at the end of our presentations. To bring us home, we're gonna now turn to the ground penetrating radar specialist who did her preliminary investigation, that's Dr. Sarah Beaulieu. And she's going to uh, talk about the, a little bit about the findings and what you can expect in those engagements. Um, and so Dr. Sarah has been a sessional instructor in anthropology and sociology at the University of the Fraser Valley since 2018. She received both her master's in 2015 and PhD from Simon Fraser University. With a research focus on modern conflict anthropology, Dr. Boyle was the first to excavate World War I internment sites in Canada. Her research contributes new information to the POW lived experience within these Canadian camps. Artifacts from her research, uh, a barbed wire cross, a handmade shovel used by POW to dig an escape tunnel are on exhibit at the Canadian History Hall in the Canadian Museum of History. While additional artifacts from her research will be part of an upcoming exhibit titled Civil Liberties to be unveiled in 2021 at the Canadian Museum of History. Her research has been highlighted in documentary That Never Happened, which has received numerous international awards and was on the official selection of the Permanent Mission of Canada to United Nations screening in Geneva, Switzerland on September 20th, 2018. Dr. Sarah uses ground penetrating radar as a remote sensing method in her work as a modern conflict anthropologist. Trained at the Canadian Forces Base Borden, she received her certification in 2016 and initially began using radar to search for lost footprints of Canada's World War I internment sites, as well as search for unmarked POW graves. With Dr. Bolio's anthropological background, she has developed a reputation for being able to interpret radar scans in a way that is both culturally sensitive and follows traditional cultural protocol. Through this work, she has liaised with the RCMP in search of clandestine uh, graves, surveyed cemeteries in the city of Abbotsford and Agassiz, and worked with First Nations communities to both survey Indigenous cemeteries and search for residential school burial sites. Dr. Bolio's research in modern conflict anthropology is diverse, and what ties it all together is her interest in applying an anthropological lens to the contemporary past in an effort to bring to light the stories of and give voice to the disenfranchised group that have been overlooked in historical record. So with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Dr. Sarah. Just a note to our tech, Rebecca, could you please spotlight Dr. Sarah? Thank you for having me. I'm just turning on my screen share here. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge uh, where I work from with the University of the Fraser Valley uh, is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Stalo peoples. I was honored to be invited by Tkamlek Shwetmik to conduct the survey with ground penetrating radar. Today, uh, I would like, I will be talking about the importance of community led surveys 
that include cultural protocols, cultural monitors, uh, and oral tellings by the knowledge keepers in order to guide the sensitive surveys in partnership with GPR specialists. I will then take you into the specifics of GPR analysis, the type of data that we are looking for and how we interpret this data. And I'll do this by providing some examples from the Tkemlik Schwetmik survey. It's important to note that remote sensing such as GPR is not necessary to know that children went missing in the residential school context. This fact has been recognized, as we know, by Indigenous communities for generations. All residential school landscapes um, are likely to, to uh, contain burials, and remote sensing, such as GPR, merely provides some spatial specificity to this truth. From the outset of any survey, it's important to include uh, community members in the design the process, the interpretation, and also the review of the investigation. And this means incorporating Indigenous values, ceremonies, and methods, uh, which are an essential part of the process. Cultural protocols and oral tellings by the knowledge keepers are as equally important as the science behind GPR. This is a partnership where Western ways of knowing work in concert with and also honor Indigenous ways of knowing, since it is these knowings that help guide the survey locations. Given the nature and sensitivity of this work, one really cannot be done without the other. Uh, I've worked with numerous Indigenous communities serving uh, cemeteries and residential school sites and also, um, or residential school sites as well, and cultural protocols are really paramount to this process. These protocols do vary from nation to nation and also from community to community. Thus, it's really important to follow the lead of each community in honoring uh, their respective cultural protocols. In the case of Tkemlip, cultural protocols took place prior to, during, and after the survey was conducted. And prior to the survey, um, sacred pipe carriers blessed the grounds uh, while smudging and prayers were also conducted, but I won't go further into the details with regards to these protocols and ceremonies as it's really not my, uh, my place to speak to specifically. In addition to the protocols, oral tellings from the ceremonial knowledge keepers, as well as the cultural monitors guided the specific survey locations while also protecting the integrity of the site. I would like to take you into some specifics regarding the GPR uh, data and interpretation. Um, so some terminology is useful. A subsurface anomaly refers to any irregularity below the surface, while a target of interest suggests that the anomaly has an increased index of suspicion for being the target of the search. When we are surveying specifically for burials, there are a number of factors that must be taken into account during the analysis of the GPR uh, data for subsurface anomalies. The type of burial, whether this be a casket, a vault, or natural, will result in notable differences in the reflection signatures, while the caskets can be further differentiated based, in, based on their material, whether this be metal or wood. The date of the burial will also affect whether the casket is intact, or has deteriorated and collapsed. And each of these scenarios will reflect differently in the data. Further, when serving for natural burials, where there's no casket, one must pay attention to the subtle soil differences reflected in the data. While the depth of the burial can change based on the age at time of death, and also the season in which the burial was dug. Typically shallow burials for smaller, um, shallow graves for smaller burials, such as juveniles and frozen ground prior to mechanical excavation will also affect the burial depths. So when graves were dug in the winter prior to the use of machinery, the depth of the grave was limited by the challenge in penetrating frozen ground. The common features of a formal burial in a cemetery setting typically include a convex reflective pattern in the upper surface of the grave shaft, a vertical refractive pattern at the size of the grave shaft, horizontal reflective patterns uh, 
at the base of the grave, but also a range of possibilities for the reflective patterns um, for the contents of the grave. These features are not exclusive to burials. However, in areas where burials are expected, they can act as a preliminary confirmation of the likelihood of burials that exist in a specific location. This slide provides you with a visual of GPR data acquired within a typical Canadian uh, cemetery context with formal burials. So this is not data from the Kamloops Residential School site. The gray screen on the right in this step is, is similar to what Dr. Andrew presented. The gray screen on the right with the two red lines running through it is what we call a radar gram. And this is what we typically see on our GPR screen while we were in the field. And on the screen, we can see this hyperbolic signature um, to the right here of an adult burial that lies approximately 1.8 meters below the surface. And this hyperbolic response correlates with the adult burial in the blue screen to the left. So this blue screen here is, uh, ex exempl exemplifies a grid system conducted in 25 centimeter transects. It's known as a profile view or slice view. And what it does is provides a bird's eye view moving incrementally below the surface where we can view the entire gridded system at once. Uh, and in this case, it's the adult burial on the right here and the child's burial on the left. It also should be noted that the colors are arbitrary. Typically dark blue represents areas with no soil disturbance, uh, while red um, notes areas with the deepest level of soil disturbance. So I'm now gonna take you through uh, four slides that present examples from the data images from the Kamlet Schwetmik site. And I'm going to use them to illustrate the process in data responses. And so in these screen captures, uh, I will also provide illustrative highlights of the graphics that indicate some of the signature responses used in determining these uh, subsurface anomalies and how they became uh, targets of interest. So in the following slides, uh, I will call targets of interest probable burials as they demonstrate multiple GPR characteristics of burials, but it's important to note that only forensic investigation through excavation will be able to conclusively determine this. So in the following screen captures here, the X axis indicates the length of the uh, scanned on the surface by the GPR, while this y-axis uh, indicates the depth of the anomalies below the surface. So on this slide, your, the probable burial is located to the right of the screen, um, and it does demonstrate multiple characteristics of, um, bur of a burial. So first we have, and I can't quite see it on my screen here, I'm going to move this, um, this orange semicircle that indicates a convex reflective pattern uh, at the upper surface of the grave shaft. And it remains approximately 0.7 meters below the surface. And then we have these red arrows that indicate this vertical refractive pattern that tell us that these are potentially the sides of the grave shaft. Above this, there's a surface depression. And um, this notes th that there's you know, a depression right here below immediately above the gray shaft. Surface depressions are common um, in known cemetery sites. Depressions occur over time when loose soil is um, used to fill the burial shaft and when it compacts or often when um, a coffin deteriorates and collapses. But now let me take you to the middle portion of the slide here um, where we can see a tree root system just past the five meter mark Tree roots um, have a lower amplitude signal here on the screen capture. And they're also noted with much smaller hyperbolic responses very near the surface. So this is where we're seeing these with a smaller hyperbolic response in contrast to this probable burial um, that is showing uh, or is indicated at a lower depth. So the second screen capture um, I provided as it contains several different anomalies that can be contrasted with the probable burial uh, that's also noted on the right of the screen, just past the 15 meter mark. It has a notable soil disturbance above the hyperbolic response 
in addition to reflections from the edge of the vertical grave shaft again. This one is unique. It also has um, the reverse polarity of the wave that's seen here as black, white, black, uh, which tells us that there is a void space below the hyperbolic response. Now, immediately uh, prior to this 15 meter mark, we can also see these lower amplitude. They're, much, they're a faint signal from the tree root systems again. And also at the seven meter mark, we can see what we call uh, a ring down signature, which is indicative of a metal object below the surface. So both the tree root system as well as the metal object are much smaller hyperbolic responses um, that are located near the surface, unlike this probable burial that is located about 0.8 meters below the surface. Uh, in this third screen capture, the probable burial is observed uh, with a much larger, more rounded hyperbolic response just past the 20 meter mark. It lies approximately 0.7 meters below the surface. There's also a distinct uh, soil disturbance above the area where the probable burial, probable burial is located. Uh, and there's also a clay layer that abruptly terminates uh, just prior to this potential burial and it um, begins again after it. It can also be contrasted again here with a smaller stone uh, just to the left of the screen uh, that demonstrates a much smaller and also a, a sharper hyperbolic response. The screen capture here represents one of the areas that was gridded on site. So the blue grid on the left is recorded in profile view or slice view. And the data here on the right represents a single line of the same grid, um, indicating a target of interest that correlates with this area on the left. The purpose of these slides is to demonstrate that there are many different anomalies that can be seen beneath the surface. And each of these present with a different set of signatures uh, that require a specialized skill set to analyze and interpret, especially when uh, surveying specifically for burials. So this would be no different than skill sets required by a physician in order to read or analyze and interpret x-rays. In closing, I would like to reiterate cultural protocols and oral tellings by the knowledge keepers are as equally important as the science behind remote sensing and GPR. This essentially becomes a partnership with Western ways of knowing uh, that work respectfully and in concert with indigenous ways of knowing. It is these oral tellings, these knowings that will guide the survey. And given the nature and sensitivity of the work, one cannot and one should not be done without the other. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Sarah. We so appreciate you joining us today. Um, Dr. Sarah, while you still are there, um, I'm just wondering, could you just explain where you're coming in from today? Because you actually had to drive in today. Uh, you're in the middle of doing some work. And I thought I'd let people know that every single person we have participating today would, could, should be in the field, but they are, we're very fortunate they're joining us today. Um, Dr. Sarah, where, did you, where were you today, if you may share? I'm actually uh, excavating in the Monastery Mountains with uh, a one internment camp or a concentration camp. Uh, with fires surrounding us, we're in an uh, evacuation area right now, but I zipped into Vernon to, um, to take part in this as it's a privilege too. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I want to indicate for each and every one of our panelists today, whether it is uh, Ted Godfordson, there's a thousand other things he could be doing other than joining us today. Uh, same thing goes with every other one of our, our panelists. And we, we thank you so very much. I invite you up, yes, uh, Ted, to uh, join us um, as part of the panel for those questions. A um, couple of things I want to make clear because it's come up many, many, many times is our one, you know, we're recording and we are sharing. So both on the Canadian Archaeological Association website, as well as the Institute of Indigenous and Prairie Archaeology, as well as to come up website, we will be indicating where you can find those recordings. If not, you can go directly to the, um, for example, the um, Canadian Archaeological Association has a dedicated space around remote uh, sensing and, and Indigenous burials. So I will invite um, 
skip a, uh, our tech to please uh, post those couple of links for people to see so they know immediately where they can go afterwards. We have a lot of questions coming in um, and um, I'm going to go to them now. Again, please feel free. It's not too late to add your questions. Also feel free to go through them and see what makes sense for you that you would also want to hear to indicate your interest. As this is a webinar, we do have to take the uh, questions written. Um, um, that's just the format of we want to be as wide open as possible for inclusion of whoever wanted to attend and that meant we had to go to the webinar format. And I'm just going to go over to the Google Doc that um, our amazing tech support has provided me because we have um, everything there so just one second. So the very first question we had was about, is it possible to get a recorded email of the meeting? Well, we already shared that. And we absolutely understand that for some people it was not, they were not able to attend. This was fairly short notice, but we felt it was imperative to get this uh, word out there and this insight and this expertise out there as quickly as possible, because we know so many communities are doing this heart-wrenching work right now, uh, following the oral tellings of survivors. We've seen this uh, explore across the country, whether it's in Brandon or uh, what's happening here in the northern part of the Shotmouth Territory with St. Joseph's, Williams Lake, to on Vancouver Island, to Saskatchewan, and to distinguish, you know, that there are different circumstances. For example, I did participate um, in the um, the news announcement about uh, Cowess's uh, First Nation and what they did indicate was there were um, tombstones and they were removed. So my understanding is that that was a, a, a cemetery and then that was removed. That is my understanding. We don't have anyone here to speak to, but I just wanna say there's different circumstances and we're here to talk from one specific uh, example, but also you have um, an array of experts to weigh in. So again, that was a question about Saskatchewan Residential School. That was an open space, a well-known space where it was accessed. Um, we also, there's a question here, um, Ted, I'll bring it over to you specifically about people wanting to do ceremony, wanting to bear witness. I know you raised some of this as part of your presentation, um, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about where you're at with um, both engagement within the community, as well as working with the home communities of where the children uh, are coming from. And I believe if I'm not, and if I misspeak, please correct me. I believe from oral tellings, we know that the children um, who attended Kamloops Indian Residential School, as Cookby said, the largest of the Indian residential school system, um, there was uh, children from across British Columbia, Northern Alberta, Yukon, and even the United States. And if I misspoke again, please correct me. But if you could go on, talk a little bit about, uh, somebody was asking about the um, wanting to observe, participate, or uh, have ceremony there themselves. Okay, Cook Stitchum. Um, so um, in wanting to make sure that everyone had the opportunity, uh, whether, like I had said earlier, from other communities to um, honor and pay their respects to the children, uh, we do, organize um, the time and space for any communities who want to come to Tecum Loops. Um, all they need to do is reach out to, uh, uh, we have a new um, email address, it's events at kib.ca. Um, you, you send us an email, we will get uh, you some documents to fill out, uh, you know, just some things that uh, special requirements or, or whatever it you know, there are different things on there that uh, you would fill out. Um, we have uh, not been able to take um, groups to the actual site as of yet. Uh, we're, we're awaiting, um, I guess, permission or confirmation from leadership uh, as to when that may happen. At some point in the future, uh, people will have access to see the site. Uh, for now, we take people, um, for example, we had the Silk Nation, Okanagan Nation come and they, um, they, did, a, they did a ride. They ha it was a fairly large group. Um, so they had access to both the monument and the Powell Arbor, all of which are located 
on the grounds of the former residential school. So uh, everything that we do is actually on the grounds of the residential school. So um, yeah, just reach out to us and we will organize with you uh, when you would like to come and, and what you would like to do. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, I just posted in the chat that is kirs at kib.c. It is posted right there for any requests for to come loops for that presence. We understand that there's a lot. And what the one thing that we did remind people at the beginning is, and as you heard uh, Ted say on behalf of his staff, that um, we do try to pace it for uh, safety and well-being of all, not just around COVID uh, protocols, but also uh, to not overwhelm the community. Uh, I have heard anecdotally that um, sometimes elders or knowledge keepers get upset because they're not able to attend everything because there's so much going on and they want to bear witness to these important exchanges. There are some questions around um, I'm going to sort of consolidate a couple of them um, and I'm inviting any of our remote sensing specialists to weigh in. In fact, if you want to weigh in, uh, jump in, let's mix it up a bit um, about remote sensing. Uh, for example, two methods in the same area, for example, magnetic and GPR. So I know that uh, actually I'm going to actually turn to you, Keisha, and I see you moving, which was because um, you did talk about the different types of remote sensing. And after you're done, Keisha, uh, anyone else who wants to weigh in, uh, please do. Yes, in, in general, it is recommended to have more than one method. It can help to confirm. There's a lot of variables in terms of whether or not it will work. What happens, though, is that there are some burials which likely do have metallic objects like coffin hardware and things like that can sometimes be detected if a coffin was used. The challenge to this sometimes is that when um, you use magnetic techniques, you can't always determine the exact sort of size and shape of what you're seeing. There are some ways to narrow that down, but it can be a little bit complicated. And in areas that might be in more urban environments or more developed environments, there can be a lot of noise and a magnetic signal. In general though, layering on an additional technique can help to build that confidence that Dr. Andrew was speaking about uh, around that what we're seeing could potentially be, be a grave. Great, I'm gonna see any further comments from Dr. Lisa, Dr. Andrew, or Dr. Sarah. I'll just mention that uh, ground penetrating radar is a go-to tool for this kind of work. And when it works well, it's the one we rely on. And it's in places where it becomes, and I noticed a few questions in the chat about forested contexts, floodplains. When it's not as clear, uh, you can usually find out fairly easily. Then we have to start layering in additional techniques. And that's where I'm going to keep on going with this. I had questions around um, harsh winters in Manitoba. We talked about, um, um, someone's asking about a uh, drown mounted thermal sensors, um, mountainous areas where graves are built with turf and stone, really different scenarios, any insights there? And again, I welcome your from anybody from our panel. I could perhaps respond. I saw there was a question about recommendations for drone mounted LIDAR. There are many options out there. Um, one that my team is currently exploring is a new, a relatively new um, drone mounted sensor from DJI. Uh, DJI is a known uh, producer of drones and they're one of the leading drone producers, certainly in the North American context and around the world. And they've recently come out with an integrated drone mounted LIDAR for one of their drones. It's not as well established, but it's quite affordable. It's got a good price point. Um, the full system drone plus LiDAR sensor is around $30,000. I can provide a specific link to that uh, setup in, um, in the response to the Q&A in text. Again, more into specifics such as um, a wooded area that has since grown into a possible known area. And then another one would be about an area that has been flooded repeatedly or covered in water for long periods of time. So I open that question up to you. So what an area that's since grown into a possible known area and then the flooded area or been covered with water for um, a long periods of time. 
And I, I may provide some guidance, I'm sure Sarah and Keisha will have others as well. Um, the ground penetrating radar tool works well when it's coupled to the ground. So it really is an open area. You can work within the avenues of trees and forests, but you can't work at that location. And of course, as Sarah pointed out, um, the tree roots themselves become signals busying up the noise in the background. So that becomes more challenging. Uh, the floodplain, the, the GPR, like a lot of these sorts of remote sensing techniques, identifies difference. So we're looking for something that's different against the background. If the entire landscape is flooded and saturated with water, um, it doesn't work very well. But you can find times of year where the conditions are not completely dry and or completely wet. And that difference usually concentrates the wetness in areas where where pits and graves and other things have been dug, and so it can be it can be a, a, a little bit about finding the right time of year where it works really well. When there's a lot of rock or obstacles, it's it's it, it becomes more difficult to navigate around. Those. You can't generally work on top of them using the the, the ground tools such as ground penetrating radar. There isn't yet a drone mounted radar at the frequencies that we would typically work with in cemeteries. But technology is improving all the time. I'm sure Sarah and Keisha have other thoughts too on that. And I welcome further comment from uh, Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Keisha, if you so wish. I'm good. Um, I think Andrew have covered a number of important uh, things there. I do think that you know it is very important to understand that environmental context in which you're working. And that helps to determine which techniques are most likely and in some of the cases where there are those sort of obstructions or things might blend into the environment or not ideal for GPR, it can be quite helpful to start with some of those aerial methods because they sometimes can detect things in different ways than the ground penetrating radar can and you can cover larger areas before taking up the very time and labor intensive um, ground based methods. And if, just one last point, the question about, about frozen landscapes, um, we tend to assume that the missing children will be in graves. And if that is not the case, then these techniques are not really applicable. There are many contexts where we might find missing children, and some of those will be beyond the, the range of tools such as uh, radar uh, and the ones we've been discussing today, which really anticipate a cemetery-like or a grave uh, uh, um, um, pattern. I have two questions for Dr. Sarah. And one is about um, a smaller hyperbolic response could be interpreted as a small tone, but ugh. tongue twisting, I tell you, let me try that again. Could the smaller hyperbolic response that has been interpreted as a small stone also be a shallow ch uh, child's burial? And then I have another one after that. No, when we're looking at these, uh, looking at the data, we're looking for multiple signatures to confirm that it is this probable burial. Um, and as I mentioned in the slides, you're looking for these reflective patterns, you know, at the top of the grave shaft, as well as the horizontal reflective pattern at the bottom of the grave shaft, as well as the refractive patterns at the side. If you have a stone, you're also having a sharper hyperbolic response from anything that's round, whether it's a stone or a pipe, or, you know, sometimes even root systems do the same thing. Um, so, and also when you're gridding, or if you're doing soft sections with these, you're able to determine how large the you know the length and width of, of what you're um, surveying as well um, so the likelihood of confusing it with a rock I would say would be slim to almost none great thank you so much for that the other question I had and I know um, there's one part I'm going to weigh in having worked with you Dr. Sarah if I say something wrong um, please or if I miss Speak, please correct me, but there is a question that we we um, did our very best to clarify, and I know that there was some misreporting. Again, we do our very best uh, for those of you who were able to watch last Thursday, July 15th. We did a public presentation to the world, and later on we did a presentation to the Tacoma membership with all of our experts on the findings that you prepared, Dr. Sarah, and we also had the participation of Dr. Lisa and Dr. Keisha just weighing in again, offering some of the insight expertise from from their various purchases and experiences as well in those findings um, from when you are you first spoke to to come loops um, both the department as well as uh, chief and council their initial number was 215 and then with additional information that was provided that number was solidly 
200 that were probable burials. That said, my understanding is you investigated 1.7 or just under two acres of 160 acres. And as we heard uh, Ted say today, we're going with that 250 number because we know that there is more, we have more oral tellings. And as you also heard Ted say today, there's already clear indication of some of the areas of investigation based on survivors' oral tellings to move forward. So there was that one sort of question out there I wanted to make clear on that one. I don't know if I misspoke or if I got it wrong, please jump in. But when, and we were clear the area that you were working on and you did talk in your public presentation and anyone who's missed it, it is posted to the Tecumseh's Facebook page. It is from July 15th. It is three and a half hours because it is not only the presentations from our, uh, yourself and others, but it's also testament of three of our beloved Kamloops Indian residential school survivors speaking their truth as well as we included the full question and answers with media as we didn't we want it to be as transparent as possible um, that said you investigated in that 1.7 acres there was multiple reasons why you investigate first and foremost based on oral tellings as well as a shovel test that brought up a juvenile tooth plus a rib bone that was found um, and in that area uh they were wondering about what type of earth it was and what frequency you used. Uh, the frequency used was at uh, 250 hertz. The type of earth was um, a, a, a sandy silt, I would say, but there was also a clay layer that was compacted in some of the areas. So on the in the areas where there was more of a compacted layer, um, the survey uh, the GPR was not able to see, you know, or penetrate those depths. Um, however, those areas were not included in um, the survey results. So I have a question about LIDAR. Um, when is the most appropriate uh, time to use drone LIDAR? And if you if you agree it's a good first scan to undertake or what would be the circumstances of using LIDAR as a good first scan? Yes, I can respond to this one. So I think in general, you would want to fly LIDAR at, at any time of year where there is no snow coverage. So because you want to be able to detect the actual ground surface, especially if we're looking for subtle depressions that may not be very deep. So uh, the otherwise the time of year doesn't really matter. There is benefit to flying when there is no uh, vegetation on trees, for example, because it does clean up the signal and make it a little bit easier for us to map the surface. But overall, the big barrier would be snow um, because snow will obscure, it will fill in those depressions and we won't be able to get an accurate view. So anytime where there's no snow on the ground, I, you know, better timing when there's less vegetation. Great, thank you so much. I'm looking at some questions about um, developing some cultural, intercultural dialogue on protocols and procedures. Um, and I was thinking about uh, Dr. Lisa and with the Canadian uh, Archaeological Association, and I believe it's through uh, your work as chair of the working group, uh, Dr. Keisha, on the standards. And I'm, my brain is failing me a little bit on those details, but if one of you could jump in there and fill in the gap of, I know you know where I'm trying to go. So turn it over to one of you, please. Yeah, so um, Dr. Lisa, if you're right, I'll, I'll start this if you have anything to add. So um, as chair of the Unmarked Caves Working Group, I think it's really important, one, to, to recognize that all the members of the working group have worked very closely with Indigenous communities for a long time and understand being respectful relations and the importance of Indigenous knowledge. As um, one of the few Indigenous people who does this type of work, they have sort of taken on that leadership role. Um, we are working to coordinate on the sort of expert side, right? So working with um, folks who have experience in forensic anthropology, forensic pathology, uh, geophysics, and also with historians. So we're trying to build out that dialogue on the expert side. I do think there's a real role as well for Indigenous leadership to come together to talk about those intercultural protocols and, and some of those other things as well. Um, and hopeful that will emerge over time that there will be a group of Indigenous leadership with whom 
um, what are what is our mostly non-Indigenous group can engage with, because we're not um, necessarily in a position to leave that, but certainly would welcome the opportunity to engage. Anything to add, Dr. Lisa? I think Keisha did a beautiful job. Um, we would absolutely welcome that engagement with Indigenous leadership. Um, and again, I just a heartfelt thank you to the Canadian Archaeological Association. I know in our conversations, uh, this uh, um, your directors, your membership to this, uh, this is all off the side of your desk. And since our findings came out in late May, I know that there's been an explosion of dedication to this. Really, the, um, I'll raise my hands to you and your directors um, for that dedication and that willingness to share your expertise as broadly as possible. There, um, we know of stories about infants may be buried or hidden in the walls of schools. Is there any techniques or such as radar or whatever that would be helpful in detecting these? Inside the walls of schools is a very difficult um, task. Um, do you, radar sometimes is used, for example, in assessing integrity of steel within bridges uh, so uh, the, as a way of kind of illuminating within within vertical spaces it's not commonly used to find um, um, aerials or, or, or missing children but uh, possible um, I, in many cases if if missing children are in places that are in that are built uh, you can find the the casement for example in the ground you can find but rather than the burial itself um, so there's a limit I think to what these techniques are do within architectural spaces. Um, it, there are many places where it will be very challenging to locate the miss, missing children. And I'll just note that we're very much focused today on the application of remote sensing techniques. There is a whole suite of forensic techniques as well. So I saw cadaver dogs came up in the, one of the questions. I think there is some applicability here that could complement some of the remote sensing work. But this, those of us who are here, our expertise is in that remote sensing and not in the forensics. And I recognize a lot of communities are exploring what some of those other forensic options are. And we're working with our partners to try to provide, again, information, um, and, and as communities make decisions about how they wish to proceed. And things like cadaver dogs may help with detection of something in a wall, um, more so than perhaps other remote sensing techniques we've outlined today. Excellent point. We could have gone a thousand different ways. Again, today is about best practices in remote sensing, uh, understanding that we did not, um, this was where we started off. Uh, we know that there's, um, uh, I know when Dr. Sarah, when you talked about uh, to come up moving forward, depending on which way some of the options and that um, when it came even to um, the probable burials and why we say the word probable burials is because it takes forensic investigation if we so wish to go that route. And that also brings up a point about um, uh, DNA and someone's asking if there's any way for DNA from the soil or whatever else. And my understanding, and I think Dr. Sarah, you talked about this in your pre public presentation last Thursday about, in, um, about the reality of DNA. And um, if you want to just jump in there about how to get it. Uh, well, I think I think DNA, first of all, it is really dependent on um, the communities involved. And there are many indigenous communities that attended each of the residential schools. And so um, the communities need to come together on this first and foremost before any DNA and forensics can be done. Um, but moving that route, and I think Keisha, you've also talked about this and can probably add more. Um, there's There are issues with it as well. It depends on the um, decomposition of the remains, uh, you know, how well preserved they are. Um, with regards to extracting DNA, there's, um, you know, then there's the issue of accessing DNA from the communities as well and storage. There's a whole lot more to it, but I think Dan, uh, Keisha, you might be able to jump on this one. Uh, again, I, I can just sort of reiterate, this is not an area that any of us here are necessarily experts in beyond our kind of training in, in the broader field, but there are definitely complexities with DNA and it's not um, always straightforward and it's not always, then there's no guarantee that all 
uh, children would be able to be identified using that technique. So there's a lot of complexities to that. And again, we're trying to work with our partners to be able, that we know in the field to provide some guidance um, for communities. And we do encourage folks who have specific questions around this, you feel free to reach out to us. It's unmarkedgraves at canadianarchaeology.com and we will do our best to respond in whatever way we can. Thank you so very much. I don't mean to put Ted on the spot, but in all this discussion that we're having right now, Ted, if there's any thoughts that you wanted to add in um, of some of the queries that you're getting from your office. I know other communities have reached out to um, and just turning to you, Ted, to see if you had anything additional to add. Uh, sure. Um, in terms of, whoops, my call. Uh, in terms of the uh, DNA and uh, the ultimate repatriation of of the children, that that is definitely a subject that is up for discussion with our um, uh, grassroots committee, uh, because um, for our people, um, our belief is to leave uh, our ancestors where they lie. Uh, there are obviously extenuating circumstances like this one, whereby our people will be discussing um, repatriation uh, and, and how that will look. Uh, you know, obviously we need to involve other communities as well, uh, our community included, and, and get to a place where we can comfortably uh, either repatriate or not, um, depending on, on how the discussion goes. That is that is the cultural component that I'd like to add to um, that uh, DNA testing. Extraction. Thank you so much, um, Ted, and thank you for um, being here. I know we've had a lot of questions um, from some individuals. We can't get, 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 can't get to all of them. It is just the nature of what we're doing here. Um, we have done our best to reach out and answer overall what has been put forward. I believe also some of the questions that were asked at the very beginning were actually answered by Ted Godfordson and how things are being handled by Tacoma to show up. So you, hopefully you heard that. If you missed it, know that we, um, again, we Canadian Archaeological Association to come to show up off our, our website as well as uh, uh, Canadian Archaeology, um, the Institute for Indigenous and Prairie um, Archaeology will all be posting the webinar there as, as well as um, the presentations that were made. So hopefully you will be able to find it. This is but a beginning. We're doing our best. We can't answer every question. This was a two hour time slot. And we, we trust that we were able to honor you in your questions and your participation in a good way. With that, I want to thank um, our panelists for coming here today and giving us their very best. Um, it's been incredible to, to um, engage with each of you. I'd like to, of course, acknowledge Cook, uh, to come to Shwetma Cookby, Roseanne Kashmir, uh, again, um, Manager of Language and Culture Revitalizations for to to Shwetma, Ted Godfordson, Dr. Le Lisa, ha Dr. Lisa, Dr. Andrew, Dr. Keisha, and Dr. Sarah, each of you for sharing your expertise, being so generous for your time. Everybody is here as a volunteer, offering of their time and their insight and their expertise. I also want to thank uh, our online tech support, um, which is um, Skip Situated Knowledge as Indigenous People in Place, for um, their most excellent online support and hosting this webinar through the University of Alberta. A particular thank you to Rebecca Gray for their online tech support to Mark Flagg, who is our uh, GK Sound AV expert here in the room who made things go as seamlessly as possible in the uh, city of Kamloops uh, COVID friendly uh, chambers. And I want to thank um, the city of Kamloops as well for um, offering this great space. I also want to thank uh, thank you uh, to Takamas uh, to Shuatma for providing in-person mental health and wellness supports here in the room to, for us today. So with that, I'm going to turn to Ted Godfordson to close us in a good way and thank each and every one of you for joining us today and we wish you the very best. Again, I will post um, one more time if you are, we touched on a heavy topics today, we want to ensure that um, after this, whether it's an hour later or in the middle of the night, if something is triggering for you or you're struggling, we do ask that you do turn to some most excellent mental and wellness supports that are available um, and, and regularly posted. I will post that in the chat right now. With that, I will turn to Ted.
Chacham. Okay, huya kwa kwanjink, kaut kukpi, yes kukstak kuk, tumalu kuk pintasit, yes kakal chin mention, as la es, as patinisums kuk, as la es, this elkst. Kaut kukpi, yes kukstak kuk, the hohoi to stem the alien to mich, and so hop mh utluk, as tikwas utluk. Kaut kukpi, Knukun to cook as Yaw and Tam are called Tans cook as for white stem the Kalmu. Look, Simon. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you for everybody for joining us today. Uh, we wish you well. Again, I have just posted uh, mental health, emotional, cultural supports for anybody online who joined us. We wish you well. Cook, Shacham. <laughs>